Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coulter, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Uh, my, uh, the title of my talk is Chronic Venous Disease Beyond Blood Thinners and Stockings. <clears throat> in general, in our medicine uh, family practice uh, and even cardiology training programs, we get pretty good uh, education regarding acute venous disease management. Patients that present with acute deep venous thrombosis, we're pretty good at managing those patients. Um, I think there's some things that I'll talk about later in the talk that we could improve upon, uh, but chronic venous disease management, really, uh, we don't get a whole lot of exposure, <clears throat> partly because we focus so much on inpatient care for patients with venous disease. So we're going to talk, uh, as our objectives are going to be review saphenous vein reflux, which is what you're mostly going to see in uh, an office practice. We're going to talk about non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, also known as May Thurner syndrome. And finally, we're going to talk uh, some about our experience here managing chronic uh, deep venous thrombosis. The prevalence of chronic venous disease is really staggering. Uh, there's over 30 million Americans that are affected either by varicose veins or some more serious form of venous disease. About 2 million uh, patients present for evaluation every year, and this is 10 times more prevalent than peripheral, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, the direct cost of these are staggering, approaching a billion dollars a year. And uh, the consequences of venous disease, we tend to see them uh, as being benign, but many patients can present with pretty debilitating disease uh, that, that requires hospital admission, about 92 per 100,000 admissions. And most of these are related to venous ulceration, uh, where there's about 20,000 new venous ulcers diagnosed every year. What are risk factors and what are the signs and symptoms of chronic venous disease? Well, risk factors, uh, older age, our veins as they age, uh, they tend to uh, dilate and this causes uh, problems with the uh, valvular structure of the veins. And family history is very prevalent in patients who have, uh, a, who have venous disease. Patients who've had a prior deep venous thrombosis can develop post-thrombotic or post-phlebitic syndrome history of superficial vein thrombophlebitis, obesity, occupations involving standing, pregnancy, female gender, other risk factors include obstructive sleep apnea, for example, and high impact physical activity, which can promote uh, dilatation of the veins. What are the typical signs and symptoms? Well, these are patients that show up to your clinic and say, uh, my legs are cramping at night, they feel heavy, they're burning, they're itching, and a lot of these patients uh, undergo these pretty extensive neurologic workups uh, and uh, frequently have venous disease. Many of them don't have obvious varicose veins or telangiectasias or other signs of venous disease that make it obvious. Uh, skin discoloration, particularly at the ankle, if you look at the medial malleolus and you see dark skin changes there, that's usually from greater saphenous vein reflux. Uh, spider veins, reticular veins, and varicose veins, of course. Edema, a patient presenting with superficial phlebitis. And uh, bleeding from a vein is another uh, presentation. Uh, the latter two require prompt treatment of their venous disease. It's important to understand a little bit about the anatomy of the venous system, the saphenous vein, which is the vein that's used for coronary bypass graft and infraringual bypasses is the longest vein in the body. Usually it originates in, uh, at, in the foot and courses uh, me, in the medial malleolus or uh, uh, in front of the medial malleolus north and uh, anastomoses in the groin at the saphenofemoral junction. At, throughout its course, it does anastomose with the deep venous system in several areas through a system of perforator veins. And those perforator veins can also develop disease. Venous anatomy is highly variable, much more variable than uh, anatomy of the arterial system. So uh, many veins are duplicated in the calf or in the thigh, and it requires really a thorough examination and Doppler and ultrasound study to assess these patients well. The small saphenous vein can also reflux, and it starts at the lateral malleolus, extends up the gastrocnemius muscles, and drains. In, frequently or usually in the popliteal fossa into the popli through the popliteal fossa into the popliteal vein. 
There's very frequent uh, thigh extensions that may uh, uh, drain into the femoral vein in the thigh or up near the buttocks. And let's talk a little bit about the physiology. So we have several mechanisms, several valves throughout the leg uh, that open during systole and close during uh, diastole to prevent blood from returning. The calf muscle pump that you see contracting and squeezing the vein can empty about 50% of the blood volume of the leg just with one contraction. If all of us here stand, and this is in your Guyton physiology book, for several minutes, venous pressure at our ankle increases to almost 100 millimeters of mercury, 90 to 100. Just walking seven to 10 steps drops that venous pressure down to 22. That's why patients that have chronic venous problems say, I gotta move, and they start walking and their legs feel better. If they're sitting all day, their legs start hurting, they walk a few minutes, their legs feel better. Uh, what ends up happening over time uh, to, the, um, to the valvular structures is that the vein, either for many of the risk factors we mentioned or just genetic predisposition, the vein wall, di the vein dilates and the valves do not coapt well. So blood starts refluxing in uh, uh, south towards the foot. And over time, you can get uh, changes in the veins below the reflux points. In very rare instances, you can get venous aneurysms, which can thrombose or uh, rupture. And uh, asymptomatic patients frequently have reflux. Uh, and uh, you can tell because they've got prominent veins or varicosities. We mentioned perforator veins. Uh, these are the veins that communicate the saphenous veins to the deep system, and they have uh, valves in themselves, and if they are big in diameter, they have significant reflux, and for a uh, Doppler study, what we look at is more than half a second of reflux to be significant. Um, they can be a source for uh, increased pressure on areas that are ulcerated. So patients that don't, that you ablate their saphenous vein or do a stripping, of their saphenous vein, their he ulcer doesn't heal, you have to look for these because they can be sources of, uh, 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 of poor healing for those wounds. There is a classification that we use to communicate between each other and it's uh, important to know. It's called the SEEP classification and it involves a clinical, etiologic, anatomic, and pathophysiologic mechanisms. We usually use the C and we'll go over what those are as the easiest way to communicate. C1 patients have telangiectasias and reticular veins, usually are minimally symptomatic. C2 patients have varicose veins. C3 have edema. C4A patients have pigmentation or eczema, and you can see this is occurring here, mostly around the medial malleolus. I ablated a lady who had the same lesion yesterday. Uh, C4B uh, is lipodermatosclerosis or atrophy blanch, which are just more, uh, more uh, significant inflammatory changes. C5 are patients who've had a healed venous ulcer and C6 are active ulcer. These patients obviously require much more aggressive treatment, uh, such as wound care, for sure graduated compression stocking therapy, and correction of the reflux uh, as detected. So in your general assessment, you do a general assessment of the patient's condition. The patient's sitting, his legs are swollen, but they're wheelchair bound and they sit all day. Well, they've lost the calf muscle pump and that's probably the main mechanism of their edema. Uh, and uh, they should wear stockings, of course. A past medical history, the patient comes in with edema and they've got congestive heart failure. That's probably a major contributor, and you can tell a patient that may have reflux and heart failure that are, their edema probably will not resolve completely uh, because they have another uh, factor to contribute to it. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the importance of an ultrasound study. That's the most important diagnostic tool beyond the clinical exam uh, to assess these patients. These patients are assessed upright. Uh, Doppler probe is put in their leg. The calf is, is squeezed, and you can see the blood going north and then refluxing south through a, in, an incompetent valve. It's important for us when we're trying to diagnose this, locate the areas of reflux so that we can target our therapy best. And what is the therapy for this condition? Well, there are numerous treatment modalities. The most important thing is to start these patients on graduated uh, compression stockings. We recommend uh, uh, class two, which is uh, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury stockings. You can just write that 
either calf or thigh. Uh, women tend to prefer calf. Men tend to prefer uh, uh, women tend to prefer thigh. Men tend to prefer calf uh, or, or knee-high stockings. <clears throat> and uh, these make uh, uh, compress the veins more and gra in a graduated fashion, compress less north, promoting forward flow. In patients that fail graduated compression stocking therapy, which you should be treated for at least three months, uh, there are several treatment modalities, traditionally strip, stripping, which is what you're seeing here, where the patient is put under general anesthesia and several incisions are made, and the vein is essentially removed from the leg. Uh, foam sclerotherapy, this is uh, particularly popular in Europe and in South America as a treatment of saphenous reflux and it involves cannulating the, the vein, in this case they're cannulating either a varicose vein or, a, or the small saphenous vein, and a foaming agent, uh, in this country sodium tetradecyl is usually used, is foamed between two syringes and injected in the vein, and this vein as it makes contact with the endothelium it damages it and closes the vein. Um, uh, the other techniques that we have are laser ablation and radiofrequency ablation, which use thermal energy to damage and contract the venous wall and occlude it with a very high success rate. And then more recently, there's been the addition of venous seal, which is approved by the FDA uh, to occlude the vein. It's uh, injecting cyanoacrylate, which is the same product that has been used for intracranial aneurysms. Well, this is injected via this catheter into the saphenous vein. It solidifies in the vein and it closes the vein. Uh, the main benefit of that latter modality is that it's pretty painless because you're not, creating, you're not delivering any thermal energy compared to ablation. And this is what we mostly use in our practice. Uh, we use the benefit procedure with, um, um, uh, with radio frequency energy. Uh, again, you advance this uh, catheter that has a heating element at the end uh, to the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, we'll see here in this uh, little video, where you make a cannulation. This is done in the office. Under ultrasound guidance, the heating element is advanced to the saphenofemoral junction. We try to stay below this little vein called the superior pegaster brain vein to reduce the risk of DVT. And the catheter is pulled back sequentially. And as you can see, as the catheter is uh, generates heat, the vein occludes. Uh, we do the entire procedure under ultrasound guidance. You'll see here the catheter moving within the vein. Uh, we inject a lot of lidocaine around the vein to protect the adjacent structures to prevent damage to um, the, the, the soft tissues and to the saphenous ver nerve that can, uh, can course close to the vein, particularly at the knee, at the uh, um, at the calf level. And uh, this procedure has been studied in, uh, in longitudinal follow-up, uh, and this da data was presented at the VEATH Symposium in 2010, uh, where they took about 300 patients and they pre performed the benefit procedure, and they saw at three years that there was successful occlusion of the vein in over 90% of patients. Uh, this five-year follow-up uh, that was presented at the American College of Phlebology in 2012 um, looked at SEEP scores in patients that had undergone the benefit procedure. And what you can see is their baseline SEEP scores were between two, three, and four. Uh, and those at five years are shifted over uh, closer to one, uh, suggesting effic clinical efficacy, not just, uh, not just occlusion, but the patients are still doing well. Are there any studies that compare this ablative techniques? <clears throat> there are. The Rasmussen study is the, actual, is, the, is the largest randomized study with over 500 patients. And I know that doesn't sound a lot, but uh, in the setting of, uh, uh, when you look at studies for drug therapy, they've got 18,000 patients. The, these procedures are very costly and, the, and they're procedure related, so and the companies generally don't have the capital, so these generally are not very large, large number of patient procedures. They randomized five, uh, 500 patients to either RF ablation and the venous laser ablation, ultrasound foam guided sclerotherapy, and venous stripping. And what you can see is that the clinical efficacy of radiofrequency laser and stripping is pretty similar at occluding the, at having a successful reflux v, v, uh, free vein at one year. What really is different amongst these is that the uh, recuperation time and the tolerability of the patient is better with radiofrequency ablation.
and with ultrasound foam guided sclerotherapy. The only negative for ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is because when you're injecting the foaming agent in the vein, you're dependent on the, the foam contacting, making contact with all the walls in the vein and that's, it's not uniform because it's just moving up with flow and so the success rate is not as high. Uh, time to return to normal activities was one day with ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy ther therapy and uh, radio frequency ablation and higher with laser and with vein stripping and time to resume the work also echoed those findings. And this is a patient uh, before and after an ablation procedure. This is not immediately after. Uh, some of these patients who have persistent large varicosities after the ablated vein is treated uh, may require stab phlebectomy or foam sclerotherapy, but uh, basically the vein is decompressed significantly. In a lot of patients, you don't have to remove the veins if they're cosmetically happy and they're not symptomatic after the ablation. What are the risks uh, of saphenous vein ablation? Well, the, the worst risk, of course, is having a deep venous thrombosis because you're near the saphenofemoral junction. Luckily, this risk is fairly low. Uh, pulmonary embolism because of the same thing. Vessel perforation is more common with uh, laser ablation because of how the energy is delivered. Uh, phlebitis, hematoma formation, uh, infection, skin burn, and nerve injury are other uh, potential risks. So now we're going to move, we're going to cover three sub subjects, uh, we're going to move over to non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions. This uh, is a clinical entity that's been described for over 50 years uh, um, uh, by May and Thurner where patients presented with either uh, leg swelling, discomfort, and uh, what was found on, on pathology was compression of the iliac of the left iliac vein by the right common iliac artery. Uh, this is natural, maybe 30 to 50 percent of us have this, uh, but it's luckily rare that it becomes clinically apparent. Uh, the artery, which is at higher pressure than the vein, creates these choke points. So the artery here is compressing the vein which is behind it, uh, the left iliac vein which is behind it. Uh, but other potential choke points are on the right common iliac vein behind. Uh, the hypogastric veins may choke the uh, internal iliac veins and more rarely you can get the, infernal, uh, uh, the inguinal ligament to compress the femoral vein. Over time what ends up happening is the repetitive uh, pulsations of the artery over the vein and the vein frequently is compressed against the spine. And I'll show you some pictures that show that. You get mural fibrosis, you get web formation within the vein and membranes that can limit flow uh, and uh, also predispose you to uh, deep venous thrombosis. And in the setting of deep venous thrombosis, these are areas that have poor resolution of thrombus. So your, your typical scenario that, that you can see is a, a patient that gets put in uh, a female typically, is the prevalence of this is higher in females. Uh, gets placed on oral contraceptives and suddenly develops a left-sided iliofemoral DVT. In that patient, if you had no other hypercoagulable state, you should at least consider the possibility that she may have may Thurner syndrome. And how you treat that patient is a little different than just um, anticoagulant therapy because correcting the lesion may reduce their risk of recurrent deep venous thrombosis and may actually improve their long-term outcome and reduction in risk of uh, post phlebitic syndrome. What's the diagnostic evaluation of these patients? Well, clinical findings. Some patients just show up uh, with, you know, my left leg is always swollen, and it's heavy, and it bothers me. Uh, typically, venography was performed to confirm this diagnosis. Uh, other diagnostic testing, Doppler ultrasound which can be challenging in the pelvis and you have some, you need a, a tech that has expertise in this. CT venography and magnetic resonance venography, which is what we're seeing here. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit more about intravascular ultrasonography. This is the left side on, a, on an imaging study and this is the right side. This is the right common iliac artery here and this is the left iliac vein. Because the IVC is to the left side of the, uh, in the retroperitoneum, the left iliac vein, uh, the left femoral vein to get to the IVC as an iliac vein has to cross over the right common iliac artery. And you can see how the vein, 
and this is the IVC, is compressed by the artery. Here you can see the spine back here, and you can see the artery is squeezing the vein against uh, the spine. And here in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a forward view, you can see why the artery is compressing the vein. And uh, on venography, uh, the accuracy of a diagnosis, this is not great. So this is um, a, um, a, st a study uh, by uh, the group, the biggest group that studied uh, iliac vein intervention uh, is a group uh, by, uh, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, names of the physicians are Dr. Raju and Dr. Neglin. And they've, extend they've published extensively about it. In their series, the diagnostic accuracy of a venogram is relatively low with over 30% of patients not having a detectable lesion on venography. This is the classic uh, finding. You do a venogram and the iliac vein looks squished in the AP view and then you have the IVC. Uh, this is a patient where really it's not terribly apparent that there's something going on here. Maybe it's a little wider, but it doesn't look too bad. And this is an essentially normal looking venogram in a patient that has by intravascular ultrasound pretty significant compression of the vein. Uh, so the clinical value of intravascular ultrasound is that the spatial resolution is very good. So you can see a normal vein here. This is a vein that's contracted, not round uh, and irregular. Uh, this is a venous webs within a vein. This is the external iliac vein. This is a common iliac vein. Again, you can see a vein that has pretty dense perivenous fibrosis and compression of the vein. Uh, and so intravascular ultrasound is very important if, in uh, patients that you want to consider doing some form of treatment. Uh, this is not for just someone that has a little bit of aching in their leg. This is someone who has really significant uh, uh, clinical complaints. With intravascular ultrasound, we can make the diagnosis. This is a pretty normal iliac vein next to an iliac artery. There's a little bit of indentation, but it doesn't look too bad. And this is a vein that looks compressed and oval uh, and uh, that, that is possibly contributing to the patient's symptoms. So we can use the IVIS not only to diagnose, but also to uh, determine the size of a stent which is one of the treatments that we offer these patients. This is a patient of mine, 60-year-old, who presented with a popliteal DVT, and uh, we went to try to treat the popliteal DVT from the contralateral side, and we went up and over, and while I was there, I said, let me take a picture up here, and I saw that there was something irregular uh, on, on the ultrasound, and uh, you're gonna see here on this, uh, on this, uh, this is the IVC, this is the aorta. Here we're coming uh, into the vein, and you can see how the vein becomes slit-like and the artery is compressing it. It's right next to it. This hyperchoic area is, is the spine. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this patient underwent uh, uh, stenting, and there's several stents available in, uh, in Europe. In this country, the most used stent is the wall stent. It has good resistance to, act, to external compression. It provides good scaffolding. And more importantly, it's the only vein that comes, it's the only stent for this application that comes in very large sizes. Iliac veins are much ar larger than iliac arteries. These are nitinol stents that usually don't come in, um, in sizes large enough to treat uh, the veins. They, they, they don't scaffold as well. Um, and uh, they tend to be compressed. Uh, we have put them in, so it's not that we haven't used them, and with some success, but we've moved towards wall stents because we think they, the patients do better. And this is that patient after we stented him, and you can see you don't see that compression, and uh, we always perform uh, ultrasound after the procedure just to document, and this is the stent now in the vein, and you can see that the artery next to it is not compressing it any longer. Uh, the technical outcomes from the group in, uh, in Mississippi uh, with over 300 patients with non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, ha they've had a primary patency of 79 and 100% patency out to six years with assisted <coughs> primary and secondary patency. If you compare that to post-thrombotic patients, patients who've had a DVT uh, th that's acute or chronic, the patency rates are much lower because you're treating a much more diseased vein that now has a space-occupying lesion of clot and, and scar. Interestingly, when they looked at their patients' clinical outcomes, according to whether or not they had 
not only a Nivels lesion, but also greater saphenous vein reflux. And compared that to patients who, the, this is patients they stented, who had Nivels without reflux, the success rate, the clinical success rate was very similar without treating the saphenous vein reflux. So they, they went and stented the iliac veins, left the saphenous veins, didn't ablate them alone. They found this lesion and they saw that both the patients with reflux and without reflux improved significantly with a good uh, or excellent clinical outcome in 75 uh, of the patients with reflux and 79 of the patients without reflux. And what this suggests is that the, either the reflux in the veins below the groin uh, is caused by this superior lesion or that just addressing one of the problems is enough to really improve, significantly improve the patient. So now we're going to shift over to chronic uh, venous disease, uh, chronic DVT. Uh, DVTs uh, are a huge burden to society. About half a million occur in the U.S. and uh, in European cities. Uh, up to 40% of patients that have a DVT develop a condition called post-phlebitic syndrome, post syndrome or post-thrombotic syndrome. And this can have be anywhere from very mild symptoms of edema uh, to lifestyle limiting claudication and in extreme cases patients can get ulceration. And uh, the most important thing is when your patient gets a DVT and you put them on blood thinners, immediately put them on, uh, on, on graduated compression stocking therapy and they should wear them daily for the next two years. That has been shown to reduce the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome by uh, over 50%. In patients that have common iliac vein or common iliac uh, or common femoral vein involvement, this is where everything in your leg is draining to. The common femoral vein and the common iliac vein Patients that have involvement in those uh, veins have the worst outcome. They have the highest risk of recurrent DVT and they have the highest risk of developing post-phlebitic syndrome. So those are the patients that should be treated most aggressively. Depending on the hospital protocols where you're at, if the patient has an femoral DVT and they're a reasonable candidate for uh, thrombolytic or, uh, therapy or thrombectomy, then you should consider uh, having the radiologist or whoever the vascular specialist is at your facility uh, treating that. There's patients that aren't candidates, have high bleeding risk. Uh, the, the vascular specialist frequently can help in discerning whether they're too risky for that type of treatment. About 4 to 15 percent of patients develop, uh, uh, have involvement of the fear of vena cava and those patients are particularly challenging to treat. And I like showing this slide because we tend to hear that one of the reasons that patients develop post-phlebitic syndrome is because they have uh, damage to the valvular structure, so they develop uh, uh, leaky veins in the legs. And this is easy to see why. This is a, how delicate a valve, a valve in a vein looks. Okay, so you can imagine any thrombus and the healing process of the thrombus can be a problem. But look at what a vein looks like inside after a chronic DVT. It, you develop significant scarring. This is evident on intravascular ultrasound. And this is inflating balloons in a patient with uh, iliac vein stenosis. You can see how tight uh, those lesions are. And these do not respond well to stents or to balloon angioplasty in the groin. Up in the iliac veins, the stents do pretty well. Um, but the best thing is to treat these patients aggressively. And I like showing this slide because we tend to hear that uh, the American Heart Association uh, in their scientific statement of 2011 recommended graduated compression stocking therapy as we mentioned and they also uh, now recommend angioplasty for femoral vein lesions uh, and, and stent placement for iliac vein lesions in patients who have chronic DVT to reduce post-thrombotic syndrome uh, symptoms and to help with healing of venous ulcers. And this is a, a case, uh, an interesting case, where we use the wall stents and, uh, that we mentioned before and we use the large stent called a palma stent to crush an inferior vena cava filter. This patient was 55 years of age, uh, had chronic DVT and a prior Simon Nightnall filter. All this stuff is hardware for back surgery. Dr. Eunice, you know this patient very well. And uh, the patient had uh, a vena cava filter that had occluded. 
And it, the IVC, which should be larger than the aorta, had uh, become a tretic. And this is a venogram after we've crossed his iliac vein occlusions, but I show this mainly to show the extensive network of collateral veins that these patients develop in order to drain the leg. And in order to drain a 60 millimeter vein, which is what an iliac vein is, you need about 16 8 millimeter collaterals. I mean, you need a lot of collaterals to drain a leg. So these patients can be very, very symptomatic. And this is the filter right here. And this is the uh, stent uh, pushing the filter to the side. This is the, the filter now crushed by the stent. And here, by intravascular ultrasound, we can see that the vein is open. And this is a before and after we've uh, placed stents to reconstruct uh, this patient's iliofemoral system in cava. This is another patient where we double-barreled just wall stents. This lady had acute on a chronic DVT. A lot of these patients have a chronic occlusion and then they close off their collaterals. Look at the, this is a superior epigastric branch. Look how extensive these collaterals are draining up into the thorax. Uh, her left side, uh, her, uh, this is her right side, she's on her belly was patent up to here, and then the bird's nest filter can be seen right here, the spokes of the bird's nest filter. And this is, uh, we did her in a stage fashion. We recanalized one side. Uh, and you can see here, these are this, this hyperechoic scar within the cava, and this is after the stent. Uh, this side had not been treated yet. And then we brought her back and, um, and we treated her uh, right side. And you can see blood coming in from the prior treatment and new blood. So we've studied, uh, uh, we've done more cases, but this is data up to 2015. Uh, almost 70 patients who've had uh, acute or chronic DVT involving the ili iliofemoral system, IVC. Uh, uh, most of these patients had some form of hypercoagulable state uh, or had anatomic variation, specifically uh, May Therner uh, or uh, 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 May Therner syndrome. Um, and some, some very few patients had anatomic obstruction. This was after uh, liver transplantation. Uh, most of the patients were female. Uh, um, average age was 46 years of age. Uh, IVC filters were present in a lot of these patients, and as you guys know from uh, data looking at IVC filter placement for DVT it, uh, uh, to prevent PE, it does reduce PE without reducing mortality, and it does increase the risk of recurrent DVT. And uh, presentations were various, patients presented with swelling, PE, pelvic congestion syndrome. We had a couple patients that presented with acute renal failure who had filters that had been placed and, and thrombosed below the renal veins. And we used a large number of mortalities that have been, some of them come and gone over the years. Uh, the most common device used is the AngioJet, which is an, uh, basically a vacuum cleaner that you pass through the uh, vein or artery and it aspirates clot. It also has a mode that allows you to squ squirt thrombolytic agent into the clot. You let it dwell there for about 20 minutes and then you can go back in there and aspirate the thrombus. Uh, Threllus thrombectomy is another form of uh, uh, catheter to aspirate clot after you, uh, you agitate TPA in the, the clot, catheter-directed thrombolysis, which most of, most of you guys are familiar with, which involves in, inserting a coaxial catheter in the vein that has multiple side holes, and you basically just uh, spray thrombolytic there over 10, 12 hours, 16 hours, a couple of days, sometimes in patients with DVTs. Uh, Angiovac is a, uh, a surgical device that is inserted via a large, over, larger than 20 French cannula in the groin of the neck, and it's used for large cable thrombus. Uh, it's, you have to do it with a, um, uh, with heart, with a, uh, uh, a veno veno bypass and a, and, a, and a centrifugal pump because you remove so much blood you have to reinsert in the patients per showing the OR. And then angioplasty and stenting was very common. The stents placed in over 60% of patients and bilateral stenting in almost 20% of patients. Technical success rate was high uh, in uh, over 90% of patients. This includes acutes and chronics. The success rate with chronic DVT is uh, uh, lower. Partial success in 8.6% of patients, unsuccessful in one patient. 
Af average hospital stay was four days, mostly for anticoagulant therapy, hematoma formation. These are patients that are getting lytics, 8%. Uh, transfusion in one, infection in one, symptomatic PE was not seen in this case series. We have a follow-up of uh, almost 40 months uh, and we've had to re-intervene on about 10 patients. This is several operators uh, at the hospital, uh, not just me, uh, Dr. Crazier, Dr. Strickman, um, uh, also uh, performed these procedures and uh, several of the vascular surgeons are now involved in doing these uh, at our hospital too. Uh, death uh, in one patient not related to the procedure uh, improved symptomatically in over 80% of patients. So if we look at, just to conclude here, a uh, treatment algorithm of how to think to treat these patients. The patient shows up to your office and you believe they have signs of venous insufficiency. They're C1 or C2s or mild C2s. In other words, they have some varicose veins that they don't bother them or they have telangiectasias. You can pop manage those medically. They probably have venous reflux, but you don't necessarily have to abate, ablate their saphenous vein. They can be treated with sclerotherapy uh, by uh, the, a lot of the cosmetic guys do this, uh, and stocking therapy. Patients with more advanced disease, C2 to C6, um, these would be symptomatic varicose veins to active ulcers. Uh, Doppler ultrasound should be performed to diagnose the extent of reflux and location. If they've got superficial venous reflux, stalking therapy for three months. If they fail, then consider ablative techniques or whatever form of therapy you, uh, you, uh, the uh, vascular surgeon performs. If they've got superficial and deep reflux or perforator reflux, the saphenous vein can still be ablated uh, and you can follow the patients and see if they need perforator treatment. Uh, in patients that have just deep reflux, then we start thinking, why do they have deep reflux? Well, if they had a DVT, then you have a reason for the deep reflux because the veins are damaged by the DVT. But if they don't, then, uh, then you should consider whether the patient has a nibbles lesion, right? An iliac vein lesion. And those patients can be referred to venography. And as we talked about now, consider ration for referral for intravascular ultrasound. Other diagnostic techniques that you may consider on your own when you see these patients, you go, look, you know, it's patient's left leg is swollen. I suspect they may have May Thurner. I'm going to get a CT venogram or an MR venogram uh, in this patient to see what they have. So learning points, uh, patients with acute or chronic DVT can be revascularized successfully with potential improvement in quality of life. Consider nibbles or May Thurner in all patients with DVT involving the left common iliac vein. Uh, correction of anatomic obstructions with stents can reduce the risk of recurrent DVT and reduce post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, nibbles are a target for therapy in patients with chronic venous disease, that means saphenous vein reflux, who don't respond to saphenous vein ablation. They still are symptomatic, maybe something else is going on. Intravascular ultrasound is a valuable tool for evaluation of these patients that you suspect that may have nibbles. IVC filter stenting is feasible generally safe. Uh, we get a lot of concerns and they're legitimate concerns that once you stent the filter then what's protecting this patient. So generally we, if we do this it's someone who's going to remain on antithrombotic therapy. Maybe their filter was put in when they couldn't get anticoagulated um, or patients uh, who uh, really had a DVT in the setting of an acute, uh, uh, acute event uh, and uh, really got the filter put in it thrombose, but they don't have a long-term chronic thrombophilia that's predisposing them to DVT. Uh, in general, you can stent the filters. Um, and, uh, and with that, I conclude.